Hello, I'm Jennifer Wilcox from the National Cryptologic Museum at the National Security Agency. Welcome to Revolutionary Secrets, Cryptology in the American Revolution. In this series, we're exploring the different cryptologic methods used by the Americans and the British and the role that it played in the Revolutionary War. In this episode, I'll be explaining some of the different code systems employed by the Americans. In our previous episode, we learned about cipher systems. Ciphers and codes may seem like the same thing, but there is a subtle difference. Ciphers change or rearrange the individual letters of a message. Codes are different from ciphers because they change entire words or phrases into something else. In the first episode of our series, we looked at visual signaling systems. These are codes because they relay in entire messages through a simple visual system. Paul Revere's two lanterns in the belfry of the Old North Church in Boston meant the British would be approaching Lexington and Concord across the Charles River. Nancy Strong, in the Culper spy ring, hung a black petticoat on her clothesline with a certain number of handkerchiefs. This code indicated where one of their agents was hiding, ready to take information across Long Island Sound to George Washington. But when most people think of code systems, they think of code books or lists, like this one. Code books and lists change syllables, words, or phrases into something else, like numbers or other words. This code list, used by the Culper spy ring, changed 763 words and names into numbers. You may remember from our first episode that the Culper spy ring was led by Major Benjamin Talmadge, who recruited his neighbors from Setauket, New York, to gather and transport messages from New York City to General Washington. That information needed to be kept secret, and Talmadge created the code the team used. Talmadge selected the words that would be included in his code. He compiled it into a simple one-part code list. That means it is both alphabetic and numeric. The word A was the code number 1. The word Zeal was code number 710. At the end, he added numbers for people, place names, and dates. His code listed 763 words. Because it is a one-part code, it's easy to use. The writer could easily find the word they needed to encode in the alphabetic list and write down its number. The receiver could just as easily find the number and see the associated word. Everything was in order. However, it is also a little easier for the enemy to solve. If they saw a low number, they could guess it was the code for a word at the beginning of the alphabet, like army, artillery, or camp, whereas a higher number meant it began with a letter later in the alphabet. This is a message written by Culper Jr., the code name of the spy in New York City who gathered information. Washington could use his list to see that 625 meant the. The message also includes a monoalphabetic cipher for words that were important but not contained in the code list. When solved, the message reads, The renowned and Daphne Eli are the only ships of war in port. In my next, will, if possible, give you a particular account of the situation of the troops. Yours, Culper Jr. The Culpers were not the only ones using code lists. Code lists also became quite popular among the representatives to foreign countries in Europe. One of the earliest two-part codes to be used in America was developed in 1781. The code list requires two parts because the words and numbers are not both simultaneously in order. The encoding page lists all the selected words in alphabetic order with its assigned code number. This page is for decoding. All the numbers are in numeric order and the words are scrambled. Two-part codes made it harder for the enemy to break. Just because a low number was used doesn't mean that it decodes to a word beginning with a letter in the first part of the alphabet. The Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Robert Livingston, created code sheets for use amongst the representatives in Europe. His pages used as many as 1,700 numbers. Several place names and some commonly used words had more than one number assigned to them. This allowed the sender to use different codes for the same words in an effort to make it difficult for the adversary to solve. Also, most numbers represented more than one word or syllable. If it was necessary to distinguish which of the possible words was intended, the sender would underline the number twice to indicate the second choice or three lines for the third choice. Another popular code system used by the military and diplomats alike was a dictionary code. John Jay, the minister to Spain, wrote to a Philadelphia businessman in 1781. Whenever you write to me, recollect that your letters will, in nine instances out of ten, be inspected before they reach me. Write nothing, therefore, that you would wish concealed. He then proceeded to describe a code using Entix Spelling Dictionary. The selected word was encoded with the page number and the count down the column to that word. 
To indicate which of the two columns the word was located, he put a dot over the first or second number. He recommended that 20 be added to the page number and 10 to the count word count. For instance, the word duration is the 10th word in the second column on page 122 and would be written like this. However, when responding to a different Philadelphia businessman, Jay suggested changing the page numbers by renumbering them from back to front. American spies and diplomats weren't the only ones using dictionaries to encode messages. So was an infamous traitor, Benedict Arnold. And I'll tell you all about that in our next segment on codes in Revolutionary Secrets. Try this revolutionary activity. Create your own two-part code. Decide which words you want in your list. Type them out alphabetically and print two copies. Also print out a list of numbers. Make sure you have enough numbers for all your words. Take one copy of your word list and cut it into strips and with one word on each piece. Mix up the words in a pile. Randomly pick one piece from the pile. That word gets the number one. Note it on your clean printouts, writing the word next to the number on the number sheet and write the number next to the word on the word sheet. Keep randomly picking words and noting them on your sheets until they're gone. If you make another copy, you can share it with a friend and send secret messages to each other in your two-part code. Have fun!